So, as a neuroscientist, I've long been interested in the brain and how neurons adapt and change in the face of disease or crisis. And so for many years, I did brain research at Harvard, at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and at the National Institute of Health. But in no time during all of those years did I study Alzheimer's disease. Um, I spent the majority of that time studying the molecular basis of drug addiction. My interest in Alzheimer's disease, which would then drive my need to become a novelist, came after all of that. And it began when I found out that my 85-year-old grandmother had walked to the bowling alley in the middle of the night, thinking it was the middle of the day, wondering where her bowling team was. Now, I think that my family is like a lot of families in that we assumed, we knew that my grandmother was becoming forgetful. Um, she would do things like she would leave the burner to the stove on, and she would leave her keys in the front door and, and not know where they were. And she was no longer handling the checkbook. My father had taken over that responsibility. But we assumed that this was a normal part of normal aging. Nana's just getting older. And I think she assumed this as well. Uh, is, uh, she didn't bring anything that was going on to our attention either. My grandfather had died back when I was seven, and so she had been living alone for a long time, and she was very active and independent, and she wasn't a complainer. But here, this walk to the bowling alley in the middle of the night couldn't be normal forgetting. And in fact, it wasn't, um, and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So my, my grandmother had nine children, and they rallied together to take care of her at home. And by they, I mean primarily her daughters. Oh, yep, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, and I was living nearby at the time working as a strategy consultant for pharmaceutical companies and um, biotech companies. And so I was around to help out and to witness this disease systematically disassemble my grandmother. But as the neuroscientist in the family, I also felt it was my responsibility to learn as much as I could about this disease and pass that information along to my aunt so that they could better take care of her. So as the sort of good little Harvard-trained neuroscientist, I first went to the scientific literature because that's where I'm most comfortable. And so I grew quickly up to speed as to the current understanding of the molecular causes of Alzheimer's. So I learned that likely through a combination of genetic and environmental influences on gene expression, my grandmother had too much of a sticky protein called amyloid beta-42. Um, and it was this accumulation of amyloid beta-42 which triggered also a host of other molecular events which clogged synaptic neurotransmission, which manifested as her symptoms of dementia. Now, I see I've either panicked or lost many of you in here. And I, I mentioned this neuro mumbo jumbo, um, and that's the end of the neuro mumbo jumbo, by the way. I mentioned this um, because while that satisfied the neuroscientist in me to learn all of that, it did very little to help the granddaughter in me. So, you know, as a neuroscientist, I was used to learning about how neurons are affected by disease on a molecular level. But as I spent more time with my grandmother, I found that I really wanted to understand how the person is affected on a human and emotional level. Um, so shortly after we all showed up to take care of my grandmother, um, she forgot who we all were. But she didn't forget all of us all at once. So with Alzheimer's, you typically lose access to your most recent memories and personal history first, and it sort of peels backwards from there. But my grandmother, being the typical Italian mother that she was, I think she forgot all of her daughters before she forgot any of her sons. <laughs> yeah. But she did, in fact, forget all of us. Um, she forgot her married name and then her maiden name. And then she forgot where she lived. Um, I remember sitting with her on the couch once, and she got up all agitated and, and alarmed. <gasps> and she walked over to the front door and opened it and looked at the numbers on the house. Oh. 148, I must be in my home. And then she sat back down next to me, and then 30 seconds later, forgetting that she went through this exercise, she stood up again, <gasps> what, what's going on, and went to the front door, oh, 148, this must be my house. But at some point, 148 lost its meaning, and she forgot that this was her house. Um, and she, I would watch her look in the mirror and study her face and clearly not understand the image she's seeing reflected back. Because at this point, she probably didn't have access to any memories beyond the age of about 20. She hadn't been married yet, according to her brain. She hadn't had any children yet. And here she's seeing an 85-year-old's face reflected back. I mean, imagine that right now. Imagine looking in the mirror and seeing someone who's 
60 or 40 or however, you know, whatever your limit is, to, um, how, how, how strange that would be to see your face 60 years older. And how do you make sense of that?